We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. start with this very kind of self-flattering question of uh, how do we get so smart? How are we humans able to think about all of the complex and sophisticated things that we think about? How do we invent them? And specifically there's a puzzle because ultimately we're physical creatures and we get only physical information from the world, right? So we get photons in our eyes, we get pressure waves in our ears, uh, we get, we're subject to gravity and we bend our toes and flex our knees to try to defy gravity and stay upright. Uh, and we can push on things and exert pressure on the world. And that somehow through this soup of physical interaction, we end up with really fancy ideas like we think about goals and principles and truth and justice and we invent ideas like time travel and imaginary numbers. Uh, how do we do that? How does that set of physical interactions and brains that are evolved for these basic physical interactions, how do they create this wonderful abstract world of ideas? And these abstract ideas are the things that actually make being human so much fun, right? So if you go to a dinner party and the only things you talk about are uh, physical concrete things, like if all you can say is, boy, uh, this podium is uh, wooden and solid, uh, you're not going to get invited back to that dinner party, right? <laughs> the things that we talk about, the things that we obsess about all day long are these abstract things. How do our minds create these? Now, this is a problem that has vexed scholars for centuries. Uh, Plato thought about it, so he thought about how would you teach someone an abstract idea like virtue? And he ends up concluding that it's impossible. Uh, and uh, we can't learn these things, so we must recollect them from past incarnations of our souls. Um, uh, Darwin actually also ran into this. So uh, Alfred Wallace, the co-originator of the theory of evolution with Darwin, uh, gave up on the theory of evolution because he got so vexed by this idea of how brains that evolved for physical interaction, how natural selection could have created brains that then invent symphonies or play chess or do any of the kinds of complex things that we do. And Darwin tried to intervene, writing to Wallace, I hope you've not murdered too completely your own and my child. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can, we can save this evolution thing. So how do we actually create these abstract ideas? Uh, I'm going to give you one specific example, and that is how we think about time. Now, uh, I do a lot of work on time. I'm not the only one obsessed with time. The word time is actually the most frequent noun in English. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because, of course, we can't see time, we can't touch time, we can't smell time, we can't taste time. It's abstract, but at the same time, it, falls the, it uh, creates the very basis of our experience, right? You can't experience anything outside of time. So how do we conceptualize this uh, abstract entity? And I'll take it one step further and ask, how do we think about something like time travel? How do we invent that idea? Of course, it's not through physical experience uh, of your own with time travel. It's not because you actually traveled to some other time and came back, and now you can recollect that idea. So here's a story of how we might come up with an idea like time travel. 
In lots of languages, we talk about time using spatial metaphors. So we'll say things like, we're approaching the holidays, or we're coming up on Christmas, uh, we're coming up on the deadline. Well, if we're coming up on the holidays, time is a path on which I'm traveling. I'm traveling from the past to the future. Well, if, once you have that analogy in place, that metaphor, if time is a path that you can travel, well, a path you can travel in whatever direction you want, in whatever speed you want. So once you set that analogy, you can now extend it and think about something that goes beyond what's possible in your physical experience. You've invented the idea of time travel just by extending this little analogy. So there are a couple of ingredients to that story. One is uh, you have to be able to make an analogy between physical experience and something more abstract. But also something has to encourage you, invite you to make that analogy. Something has to say, well, why don't you try thinking about moving in time like moving in space? And then you can go beyond that. Right? How do we know that any part of the story that I just told you is true, that people actually do these kinds of extensions? Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, in English, we actually have two kind of opposing ways of talking about time. One uh, talks about ourselves as moving from the past to the future. We call this the ego moving metaphor. And we say things like, we're approaching the deadline. Uh, the other one uh, goes in the opposite direction. We're stationary, and time is moving past us, like a train or a river. We call this the time moving metaphor. And so you might say something like, the deadline is approaching. Now, in a strict physical sense, if I'm approaching the deadline, or the deadline is approaching me, those are the same. Right? If time is really a unidirectional, one-dimensional entity, it doesn't actually matter which one of us is moving. But in space, it matters. So if I'm moving towards you, or you're moving towards me, those two things are different because there's a fixed ground against which we're moving. So we can actually tell the difference of which one is happening. How do we know if people really think about, I'm approaching the deadline, as being different from the deadline is approaching? Do people really take these spatial metaphors seriously? Here's uh, one hint. Suppose I ask you, next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days. What day is the meeting now that it's been rescheduled? <laughs> Who thinks Monday? Who thinks Friday? OK, it's about normal. Um, so if you're thinking of time moving towards you, then moving the meeting forward is mo moving the meeting in the direction of motion of time from Wednesday to Monday. But if you think of yourself as moving through time, then moving the meeting forward is moving the meeting in your direction of motion from Wednesday to Friday. Right? And we can actually get people to imagine motion in space. So for example, we'd say, imagine how you'd maneuver the chair to the X. And you either have to imagine yourself scooting in a chair somewhere, or you imagine pulling a rope to bring a chair to you. So in one case, you're imagining yourself moving. In the other case, something is coming towards you. And after people have imagined one or the other, we slip in this seemingly unrelated question about time. We say, next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days. What day is the meeting? And what we find is people who have been imagining themselves moving forward through space will say the meeting is now on Friday. People who have been imagining something coming towards them will say the meeting is now on Monday. Of course, they don't know that they're being uh, influenced by this imagination exercise that we gave them. But what it's telling us is people are actively using the spatial image that they created to think about time. Right? That actually, these two scenarios in time are psychologically different from them. Now, the other thing about how we think about time is that it differs from uh, culture to culture. So we haven't, humans haven't invented just one way of thinking about time, but we've invented many, many different ways. Let me give you just a few examples. So uh, in English, of course, we read and write from left to right. And uh, it's natural to then organize all kinds of things from left to right. So here, I'm showing you pictures of my grandfather at different ages. And if I gave you this set of cards, shuffled them, and said, please lay them out in the correct order, chances are you would lay them out exactly like this, from left to right. We consider this to be the correct order, the correct arrangement. But uh, people who read and write from right to left, for example, people who read Arabic or Hebrew, will organize these cards from right to left. Right. So uh, for them, uh, the direction of time goes in the opposite direction. And just to give you an intuition for this, 
Um, here's a, a logo for a nutritional supplement for kids. And you can read this logo very easily, and you can see what it does for your child. Uh, when they tried using this in Arabic-speaking countries, they ran into some problems. Because if you read the logo from right to left, it becomes quite problematic and confusing what it does for your child. Now, uh, so far I've given you examples of how time can travel with respect to the body, either left to right or right to left. Uh, but it can also um, travel not with respect to the body at all. So here's an example. Um, this is a, an Aboriginal community in Australia that I had a chance to work with. They live on the edge of Cape York. Uh, they're the Kuktaior people. And what's interesting about languages like Kuktaior is they don't use words like left and right. And instead, they primarily rely, rely on words like north, south, east, and west cardinal direction terms. And uh, when I say they primarily rely on cardinal direction terms, I, I really mean that at all scales. So even for body parts, you would say, uh, there's an ant on your southwest leg, or move your cup to the north, northeast a little bit, uh, things like that. Even the way you say hello in Kuktaior is to say, which way are you heading? And the answer should be something like uh, north, northwest in the far distance. How about you? Uh, so imagine as you walk around your day, Everyone you greet, uh, you have to report your heading direction. Right? <laughs> that would get you oriented really quickly, right? Because literally, you could not get past hello uh, without knowing uh, which way is which. And uh, let's just establish that we uh, don't think like this. So everyone close your eyes for a second. Uh, and I can see you, so I can tell whether or not you've closed your eyes. Uh, point southeast. <laughs> All right, you can open your eyes. I see points in every possible direction. <laughs> At least some of you are right. Um, that's good. So uh, people who speak languages like uh, Kuktai are actually still oriented really well. Uh, they can point southeast without hesitation. Even young children can do that. Uh, but I also wondered, how do they think about time? So if they don't think about left and right uh, with respect to space, how do they lay out time? So remember, if I give you this task, I give you a bunch of cards to lay out, what would they do? So uh, here's an example. This is uh, one participant. They're sitting facing south. And this is a bunch of different card sets they've laid out. And what they've done is go from left to right in each case. Here's uh, another participant. I'm sorry, this is the same participant on a different day, sitting facing north. And they've laid everything out now from right to left. Here's a different person sitting facing east. And they've laid everything out coming towards the body. What's the pattern? It's the sun from east to west, right? So for them, time is locked on the landscape. It doesn't stay locked on the body. So for me as an English speaker, if I'm facing this way, then time goes this way. And if I'm facing this way, then time goes this way. And if I'm facing this way, then time goes this way. Very egocentric of me to make the dimension of time chase me around every time I turn my body. Uh, instead, for the Kuktai, or time always goes in the same direction with respect to the landscape, regardless of which way their body is facing. And this isn't the only way that time can flow according to the landscape. So for example, work by Rafael Nunez here at UCSD shows that time doesn't even have to go in a straight line. So for example, for the Yupno of Papua New Guinea, time uh, flows into the village at one angle. And then once it hits the village, it takes a turn and flows out at a different angle. And this has to do with the mouth and the source of the Yupno River, which are important uh, geographical locations. So people around the world have imagined all kinds of ways to organize this very basic dimension, right? Whether it goes left to right, right to left, there are vertical organizations, uh, organizations that go on the landscape in all kinds of different ways. Uh, there's a really rich variety that humans have invented around the world. Now, you could ask, how deeply rooted is this imagined time in our idea of space? So if you were to um, disable the part of the brain that processes a particular part of space, would that also disrupt our ability to imagine that part of time? Uh, and we actually had a chance to test this idea by looking at patients who've suffered strokes in the right parietal lobe. So here I'm showing you the brain of Federico Fellini after he suffered a stroke in his right parietal lobe. And this kind of stroke often results in uh, neglect on the opposite side of the stroke. 
If you have left neglect uh, in everyday life, you might uh, not see, not notice food on the left side of your plate. You might only eat the food on the right side of your plate, even though you're still hungry. You might only put makeup on the one side of your face or shave one side of your face. You might only read words on one side of the page. Uh, people with neglect uh, seem to not notice, not pay attention to things on the left side of space for them. This member of KISS doesn't have neglect as far as I know, but this is how he would do his makeup if he needed. <laughs> So uh, we wondered, uh, how would patients who neglect the left side of space think about time? So we told uh, patients about uh, a guy, David, fictional guy, David, who liked doing some things 10 years ago and will like doing different things 10 years from now. So 10 years ago, he liked strawberries, but 10 years from now, he'll like cherries. And I just had to remember these facts. And we had a couple of control groups. Uh, we had healthy controls and also patients who'd had a stroke but didn't show signs of neglect. So let me show you data from the two control groups first. Um, so the solid bars here show you the items that people got right. And everything to the right of the center is things to do with the future. Everything to the left of the center is things to do with the past. The shaded areas are where people made mistakes. Now, uh, of course, both groups made some mistakes, but the mistakes are symmetrical around the, pa the past and the future. Here's what the neglect patients look like. They were heavily shifted to the right. Uh, they weren't able to recognize correctly things that had to do with the past, with the left side of the mental timeline. Uh, and instead, they misattributed a whole lot of things uh, to, uh, to the right. So when you damage the part of the brain that's responsible for representing the left side of space, you also damage the imagined left. The, uh, the time that you imagine on the left side of uh, your body. Now, I've been giving you a lot of examples about how we imagine time as space and how metaphors and uh, cultural artifacts like reading and writing uh, invite us to make different kinds of analogies. But uh, of course, these ideas go far beyond how we think about time because uh, metaphor is ubiquitous in, uh, in our experience. Right? Just about anything that's complex or interesting uh, is at least partially imagined. Uh, and uh, the way we talk about these complex, interesting things is suffused with metaphor. So uh, if you're talking about a relationship problem, you might say, uh, we've, um, we're spinning our wheels, our relationship is off track. Uh, if we're talking about the economy, you might say, we need to jumpstart the economy. And the idea is that a quick stimulus is what the economy needs to get going again. Or you might say that we need to prop up the economy. And then you're using a, a, a different set of uh, physical metaphors to think about what needs to happen. Um, when we talk about theories or ideas, we could talk about poking holes or warming up to ideas. Uh, with social issues, we talk about immigrants as seeping into the country as if there's some kind of nefarious substance, uh, or crime as preying or infecting uh, our neighborhoods. And these metaphors have psychological weight. Uh, so for example, in our lab, we've looked at how people want to approach a crime problem in a city if you tell them that crime is a beast uh, in, uh, plaguing their city or pre preying on their city, as opposed to crime is a virus. If you tell them crime is a beast, they want to uh, do the kinds of things you would normally do to contain a beast, so they want harsher enforcement measures. Uh, if you tell them crime is a virus, they want to take a more uh, epidemiological approach. They want to diagnose the problem, maybe inoculate the population, uh, do, do things that are more reform-oriented. So these metaphors have real psychological weight. So uh, coming back to this question of how do we get so smart, um, my answer would be that our brains are masters at doing dynamic opportunistic bricolage. They recycle and reuse machinery that has evolved for uh, simpler perceptual motor tasks. They recycle and reuse the knowledge that we acquire through physical experience, but also Language is an incredibly powerful tool that invites us to conjure up those ideas and recombine them in all kinds of novel ways. Because language supplies us with a large stock of units, but an infinite ability to recombine them. So uh, I can right now take a bunch of words, put them in a new configuration, and invite you to imagine something you've never imagined before. So I could say, imagine 
um, a circle of hedgehogs dancing the polka on top of a crepe that is traveling through time from Paleolithic times to now to puzzle us about how they were able to make such fine, thin pastry back then. <laughs> now, um, if everything has gone relatively well in your life so far, you haven't had that thought before, right? <laughs> and so, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> That is, through the power of language, we can conjure up all kinds of ideas, an infinite set of new ideas, by recombining things from our physical experience and from other abstract ideas we've built in the past. Thank you very much.